Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show. This is take two by the way. I didn't start any wine drinking, but um, I didn't start the microphone recording here. So I'm gonna talk about that real quick. I was kind of talking about it and the irony was I hadn't started recording from the, the recorder. Well, I mean, you can even see it, I didn't pull it out. Um, when you're syncing your sound, when you're not using the on-camera microphone, which again we talked about, you try to you want it as fast as possible get away from using the on-camera microphone for sound quality. Um, the cheap and dirty and the cheap and dirty way of uh, um, syncing your sound, um, you may have seen that in the movies they have that clapboard, okay? Well, because it makes a clap sound. Well, I don't have that. I don't need to. I mean, I actually have an app on the iPad. But my question is, or my problem with, with the iPad thing is, is the sound gonna be loud enough for that? So instead of buying like a clapboard itself, you know what I do? Right before I start talking, I clap three times. And what that does is this microphone picks up the three claps pretty, pretty loudly. That microphone, the camera picks up the claps and then I just sync it because you have a very hard spike in your audio. Then everything is synced. That's how you sync audio, not hard. Uh, green screen real quick, um, it's night, I don't really have to worry about any background light, but if you have, since I have half of a wall behind the green screen, you have to be careful what's behind the green screen, that some of the stuff may reflect back. One, if there's light, like the lights are on in the kitchen, or the sunlight's streaming through the, the windows back there in the, in the dining area, um, it'll, it'll spill through. Um, it's not so bad, these lights are gonna kind of drown that out. But the other thing to remember is these lights are gonna go through the green screen. So you may have noticed in the pictures there's a tea service that, or the, the opening in the video last week, you see the tea, you saw the tea service behind me on, on the cap, on the China, not China, the Korean cabinet. Well, when I put the green screen up, I moved that China, I moved that tea service off to the side because these lights reflect off of it. You see, if you look at some of the videos, you'll see like this little like sparkly stuff behind me. That's because the light is spilling through and reflecting back and the camera's picking up on that. Uh, the refrigerator and the microwave oven behind me, they reflect the lights. So I put something over those to, to prevent the reflection. So food for thought on that. Okay, so let's get into the first wine. Take a drink. All right, so this is the first value wine we're doing today. Now, now disclaimer for today and next week's show. This week's and next week's show. I had opened these bottles up two days ago, uh, actually almost two and a half days ago at this point, anticipating recording on a Tuesday. Some stuff happened, wasn't able to record it. Um, when I got home late, late that night, I was like too exhausted, I had to be at work. Um, not early, I, I think I was a closing manager that day, but I, I just really didn't want to try to get through all this stuff, through all this stuff. So what I had to do is I had to use the vacuum vent Okay, stoppered it up, and then I put them in the, in the refrigerator to, to not just pick the vacuum in to get all the air out, which is really no air, because it's just whatever the, was the same thing as with the cork, um, but to slow down the uh, mo air molecule, so the aging of the, the bottle was a lot lower. These are still pretty cool, but honestly, this bottle, even though it's a red wine, is probably right close to what cellar temperature is. So I'm, I'm probably from one of the first times ever tasting a red wine at the proper serving temperature, okay? Or, well, storage temperature, and it might actually be closer to the proper serving temperature in the mid-60s. So um, with that said also, and, and I mentioned that on, on Twitter that I was, I've used the vacuum in, somebody was like, don't ever use vacuum in ever, ever, ever. It, 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 it sucks out the aromas, it doesn't have a good seal, it oxidizes everything. There's a lot of, I've never heard of that, but there's a lot of stuff on the internet about that the vacuum in this little thing with the little pump, okay, that they don't really work, that the wine still ages and oxidizes as much as if you just put the cork back in. 
You know what? I, I can say that I've had some mixed results of the wine. I've tasted these wines and then a few days later, I've had them and they've been vacuum vined um, and they didn't necessarily taste that good or they felt like they got worse. So reading all that kind of confirmed that sometimes the seal isn't that great. With that said, the next four wines today and next week, there may be some issues, but hopefully not because I kept them in the, in the uh, not microwave, kept them in the refrigerator. All right, so what do we have here today? All right, this is the, the non-vintage, if I remember right, non-vintage Frontier Red, the 10th anniversary edition, lot number 111. Uh, this is made by Fess Parker. Now, those of you that are older than I am, because I do not remember this, uh, Fess Parker was an actor, and ooh, we don't want to get it on the laptop there. He was an actor, and he was famous uh, for portraying Davy Crockett and um, Daniel Boone in two different types of things, okay? Uh, both of them, I think, were, were television deals. Uh, first of all, I bought this at World Market for $10.99. Uh, now, this is a blend of, this is a red wine, it's a blend of stuff. Um, and I'll, I'll read the front part just because it, it, it helps tie in the whole Fest Parker thing. Over 50 years ago, the Davy Crockett Show debuted, with, debuted and struck a chord with millions of people around the world. Over 40 years ago, the Daniel Boone Show debuted with similar success. The Fest Parker Winery invites you to reminisce over a good bottle of wine. So he was, the, he was the guy that played Davy Crockett and also played um, Daniel Boone in two different television shows. So he was well known for that. Um, he did a few other things and then he eventually bought a winery uh, and got into wine, wine making in California. So he has, and, he's, and uh, he's had this winery, or he, he's not alive anymore. He passed away, uh, not 2003, a few years ago. Um, but his son and family run, run it. But... Um, uh, so he actually been, you know, the winery's been around for quite a while. Matter of fact, um, I thought I had that pulled up. I don't, but uh, it was in the 80s, if I remember correctly, that they started the winery. Okay, so, um, let's see, newest acquisition, that was the newest acquisition. All right, so we're just going to move on, talk about the wine itself. Now this wine is uh, this particular this particular lot. It's not a vintage. Um, is sourced from quite a few different vineyards. Um, I'm not going to go through the percentages of all of them, but they ha the Fest Parker owns and sources wines from multiple vineyards. What's in what what grapes are in it? You have 36% Syrah, 20 per, 20% Cinso, 12% Petit Syrah, 11% Grenache, 8% 8% Carignan, 6% Tempranillo. 3% uh, Suzo, Suzo, uh, yeah, 2% uh, Cunois, and 2% Mervedra. So you got a lot of different wines in here. Now, uh, Suzo um, is from Portugal, is a Portuguese grape, and uh, Cunois is a uh, French grape uh, from the Rhone area. And uh, so you have, and also with Carignan, it's also the same uh, from the s south part of France. All right, so let's check it out. Very purpley, but then again, the lights may be kind of affecting that. All right, off the nose, I get kind of a An earthiness and minerality to it. Um, get some red fruit. Not much floral on it, but you know, I get mostly earthiness and some dark red fruits. I am a little bit concerned that the wine may have been affected a little bit, but sometimes the nose is deceiving in many ways. It's got some good acid, really medium to medium low tannins. Um, it feels a little hot alcohol wise, and it, it is. It's 15.6% alcohol. 
the alcohol may not be contained so well. And that's a bit of a concern because this is served chilled in, in essence. If I was drinking this at room temperature, which is around 70 to 72 degrees in the house, sometimes a little warmer being it in the summertime, um, the alcohol might actually be a little bit over the top. Um, this is not uncommon in hot, in hot, um, in hot climate areas for alcohol to be high because if your grapes are very, very ripe, they have a high sugar content, then they have a high potential alcohol. I feel like I'm getting a smoke bomb aspect to it, almost a sulfur thing. It's got a lot of wood aspect to it, um, almost a bit, you know, a bit of wood, like cedar box, like biting into a, biting into the actual tree trunk type of thing to it. Uh, again, you got the darker red fruits. No, I don't really get anything specific out of it. Um, it is a bit tart, um, not sour, but a bit tart. Uh, like I said, it's not it's not very full bodied really, but it's got pretty high acid, but the tannins are are pretty are pretty calm. Um, it's not a bad wine. It's an eleven dollar bottle of wine. Um, this is the first of the four wines that I'm going to be reviewing today. Granted, one's this week, and then the other. I'm sorry, two are this week, and the other two are next week, but uh, in one sitting. So I'm not sure if uh, this is how the wine would have tasted two days ago but I can't imagine it would taste it too much different. I'm not overly impressed with it. It's not a bad wine by any means, um, but it's a bit high in alcohol content. I'm not really a fan of really high alcohol wine. Um, it's not, it doesn't feel like the alcohol is contained by the wine, um, but it's not a bad wine. I, I, I'd give it an 84. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a ding just because I really don't get a lot out of it or, or as much as I think I should. Um, again, it's not cold. I mean, I, I've, I pulled that out of the refrigerator two hours ago, so it is not cold by any means. Um, but it's probably pretty close to the type of serving temperature that you want. Two hours ago? Yeah, pretty much two hours ago when I pulled it out of the, the fridge. It's not a horrible wine. I just, it's not bad. Maybe it'll taste better a couple days from now, but um, it's all right. 84 is the score I would give for that. Okay, before I hit the commercial break, we're gonna do a commercial commercial because those of you that watch on TiVo, uh, and I've noticed now, granted, since I've switched to this format, it seems like I get a lot more retention of viewers. People really watching all the way to the end, which is, or mostly to the end, which is awesome. And I just want to, again, thank all of you. For those of you that have been watching since the beginning and, and my newer viewers, it's awesome. But yeah, a lot of people are watching off of set-top boxes. So, the blip ads never show up. So, first of all, we're going to talk about a book real quick. All right, Wine for Dummies. Honestly, a great book. Now, I have... I started with the regular Wine for Dummies book, but this is the five in one book. So it's got uh, the Wine for Dummies, French wine, Italian wine, Cali wine, and Australian and New Zealand wine. So it's got five different things. Honestly, I haven't read all of them, but uh, I have it as a great reference. Um, if you're looking, if you're kind of starting out with wine and people are always asking me, well, you know, how did you learn about this? This is the first book I literally read about wine as a suggestion. It's a great primer or primer, whatever you want to call it. Um, on, on just kind of getting an idea about wine in the regions of the world. Um, this particular book is, uh, I bought at Borders for $30. Uh, you can probably find it on Amazon for around the same amount of money. The regular just Wine for Dummies book, I don't remember how much, how much I paid for it, but I'm going to guess it's around $10 to $15. Uh, but uh, awesome, excellent investment. Link below. Uh, for the Amazon version, if I can't find this, I'll do the original one. And uh, stop by and buy it. Hey, I get a couple cents from that. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Let's take a break. Not a break, but we'll move on to the next wine, and we'll see you in just a couple seconds. All right, we're back. 
So uh, the for the premium wine segment, I was sitting, I'm not sitting, I was over at uh, HEB Central Market. I hadn't been there in a minute, and I hadn't given HEB any love recently. So I decided I wanted to get some of my premium wines from them. Now, technically, this wine doesn't qualify as a premium wine because it is under $20, uh, but it's $19.99. So I went ahead and bought this because I really want to do a, a, not true rosé, but a classic rosé. Let's put it that way. This is the 2011 Chateau uh, de Cadia, all right, uh, rosé from Tavel. Uh, Tavel is in the southern Rhone region of France. It's kind of across the way from Chateau Neuf de Pop. And uh, let's not put the wine bottle on top of the camera remote and turn off the camera by accident. Bought it for $19.99 at HEB Central Market. Now, HEB, if you're a local viewer or at least a Texas viewer, HEB typically runs a special. If you buy six bottles of wine, you get 10% off. I bought seven bottles that day, including the three cul-de-sac wines, which I have yet to re review two of them. Um, so, uh, rosé. So, let's talk about what this is. Rosé in southern France is a very uh, traditional wine for them. Um, rosés are, um, if I remember correctly, with French law, rosés have to be made from red grapes. You can't mix in white grape or juice from white grapes to dilute red wine. So, rosé wines are created with red grapes and they have very low... Um, uh, very little contact. The skins have very uh, little contact with the grape juice, with the must. And that's how you get the red from red wine or for red wine. Okay. So um, this particular blend is uh, what, six, seven different varietals. Okay. So let's go through them real quick. Uh, Brimbalunk, uh 6%. Claret, uh, 9%. Funny thing about Cladet, um, you have claret, claret, cladet, you know, whatever. Uh, what, some of them are, well, that, that particular one is a grape, but claret, if you're talking about Bordeaux wines, is the English name for red Bordeaux wines. I won't go too much into that. Uh, Grenache, 52%. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the percentages of the other two, 6% and 9%. Uh, Syrah, 12%. Mavedra, 11%. Cinso, 8%. And Pickpool, 2%. We have this winery here, um, not quite up the road, but near San Antonio. Uh, they make a Pickpool Blanc. So there's a Blanc version of Pickpool. It's pretty good, by the way. Highly suggested. I think it's the Comfort, Comfort Wine Company or something like that. Comfort Texas is right around there. I think that's the name of the... the Bending Branch. I'm sorry. They're in Comfort. Bending Branch. If you uh, can find it, buy it. It's pretty tasty. All right. Oh, yeah. $19.99. Nice. Now, first of all, rosés, classic rosés are not white Zinfandel. They're not sweet wines. They're going to be dry wines. But you, you will get some fruity characteristics to it, um, but a dryness to it. We're going to be talking about that, I believe, next week. Dryness is going to be part of a subject matter. So I get kind of a watermelon aspect to it. Um, bright red fruits. It kind of smells sweet. And that's what's kind of tricky sometimes with rosés. They maybe smell sweet, but they don't taste sweet. I honestly almost get kind of a green apple aspect out of it, which I'm a little surprised about. But I also maybe just picking up something that's just stranger, pulling it out of my, you know, you know what. But I really do get kind of that green apple candy type of thing. Almost the watermelon hard candy. Okay. Really get that kind of hard candy watermelon thing. All right, let's see how it tastes. All right, first of all, I can tell you that being opened two days ago and being vacuumed in and put in the refrigerator has not affected this wine at all. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, 
anyway, there's stuff going on the, off to the side. So I keep looking over there, expecting someone to show up. Anyway, um, I get that watermelon a little bit, but I also get a bit of strawberry. Strawberry. I just like the saying that word. Freaking love strawberries, by the way. I almost munched on some at work today. But I didn't. Pretty high acid, though. And this is dry. You don't really get that over sweetness to it. It's pretty dry. It's very, very refreshing. You know, it, it's, again, approaching 100 degrees out down here in Texas. Um, this is a great wine, I think, to have. Um, first of all, just to have if you're kind of relaxing in a picnic and you're trying to drink some chilled wine, maybe chilled a little bit more, it'd be awesome. You pair it with some fruit, pair it with a salad, um, it would be phenomenal. Um, I think it's, I think it's an excellent, excellent rosé. Um, we don't drink rosés enough. I think I don't drink rosés enough. Um, but don't fear the pink stuff. It's some, you get some really great stuff out of this. I mean, it's the, the, the bouquet is phenomenal. It's just, I think it's great. I think it's good enough to give it a 90. I mean, buy it. You're not gonna be disappointed spending $20 for, for pink wine. Um, let's see if I can look at what they talked about real quick. Oh, they talk about raspberry in the, on the nose. They didn't really get raspberry. Uh, round and chewy, pleasant mineral notes. Um, I guess maybe some mineral notes, but nothing, nothing great. But um, uh, the maceration, which is the skin contact with the juice, is uh, 24 to 48 hours. So it's actually, in some ways, kind of long. I know some rosés that are not, barely even a day of maceration or, or skin contact. If you can find this wine, um, I highly suggest that you buy it. Really, I do. Got through this one pretty quick. You know why? Because Wine 101 is gonna be kind of long. Now, uh, after the, the curtain break, um, we're going to be talking about the 1855 classification of Bordeaux. Um, it's not necessarily a propeller head episode, but you want to make sure you kind of pay attention. So uh, we're going to go ahead and kind of clear the set. Well, actually, I'm going to record the next two wines, and then I'm going to do two presentations. So um, I'm going to clear everything off as far as you're concerned. Go right into the presentation, and we'll see everyone in a few seconds. All right, and we're back now for some Wine 101. So what we're we gonna do today, we're gonna do the 1855 classification of Bordeaux. All right, so what is that? All right, so <clears throat> it's not the first type of classification of wine as far as like g giving wine some, some recognition, but it is one of the oldest. And it was created um, because Napoleon III was having this expo in 1855 and he wanted to represent all of France's great wines. So um, it's called the Universal Exposition. And he contacted the Syndicat of Courtiers, and uh, he, he uh, which was, um, I'm sorry, actually, the contact of the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce of Bordeaux, and they went to the Syndicate. Um, so the Courtier Syndicate. And uh, so they were like, we want five crew of wine, or five growths, um, of, of wine, so the five levels, five best levels. And uh, so they came up with uh, a listing of 58 chateaux. Now, depending on how you're counting all this, uh, in 1855 there was one chateau that was left off, we're going to talk about it in a second, and then it was put on in 1856. It was kind of one of those, oops, we forgot to put it on the map and on the list, but it was supposed to be on there. Um, now, currently there are 61. Now, the list, is that, the list has only changed twice. Once, the, the second year where we had the oops, and one other year we had one other change. So how did that create 61? Well, over time, Chateau go out of business, they get sold off, they get absorbed by other ones, they split up, 
uh, for, throughout the heirs. So they, it's basically stayed the same, but there's been a growth in three chateau o- over time. Now this particular um, list was actually supposed to be a one-time only list. It was not meant to be official, but it kind of did become official. All right, so um, there are other classifications that have happened with wine uh, or happened with Bordeaux. Um, as early as 1787, Thomas Jefferson actually tried to rank uh, all the wines of Bordeaux. Uh, this list is actually based upon the historical prices. So back in 1855, it honestly was pretty much what was the most expensive wine, therefore, you know, what's the most expensive wine that, that should be the best wine. And, I mean, there is a logic to that. If there's demand for the wine, it must be a good wine, therefore, it's going to be higher priced than something else. Um, but over time... Uh, because, you know, they, there's been controversy about how it's not changed, that some chateaux haven't really held on to what they should have been. Their wines aren't as good as they used to be. And, other, and, and then sometimes they've, they've come back and been as good or better as before. But um, there really is no movement. Um, in 1856, uh, Chateau Cant- Cantelmer um, was added to the fifth growth. Uh, again, that was the one that was left off. In 1973... Uh, Mr. Rothschild uh, really lobbied hard forever, for decades. Uh, in 1973, he, he elevated his chateau, Mouton Rothschild, to a first growth from a second growth. Um, there are people out there that consider it outdated because it really, again, hasn't changed much. Be- and and the, the reasoning is that, uh, and I'm not an expert on Bordeaux wine, or at least especially on the classification ones, um, but there are experts out there that have said that the wines, that some of these wines aren't as good as they used to be, and therefore these things should be updated a little more often. All right, so um, let's talk about the first growths. You have five of them. Um, I thought I had, no, I guess I didn't. Okay, so you have five first growths. Uh, And I took these and I put them in the order that was in the original list, and a uh, according to the records back then, that even within the growths, they ranked the wine. So in 1855, this was the best to worst of the fifth, well, the f- four of them, okay? But these were the best to worst of the wines. Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, which is in Poyac. Uh, Chateau Latour, which is also in Poyac. Chateau Margaux, which is in Margaux. Uh, Chateau Hopbrion, which is in the Passac and Graves area which is the only, uh, well, first of all, first growth, but one of the only, um, one of the only uh, chateau that's actually by Bordeaux itself, okay? And then uh, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, which is also in Poyac. Now, each of these uh, chateau, they make incredible wines, and I've never had any of them. I hope to have some of them someday. When I went to Bordeaux last year, I was hoping to at least, you know, knock on the door at one of them, but wasn't able to. I took a couple pictures of them, of, of, of the chateau, uh, and saw their vineyards, but wasn't able to, to try them out. And I was too scared to like hop out of the car and like grab a grape, but um, for fear of like being put in French jail. But um, so these are, these are the ones that really everybody kind of measures themselves by in Bordeaux and really wines around the world. Um, I'm not gonna go through each of the second growths, okay? I'm not going to mention it, but I'll give you kind of an overview. Now you've gotten, this is what I was looking for, I thought I had numeric, I thought I had put down in the slide how many of each there are. There are, so let me count them real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 14, that's right. Seven, 14 second growths. Now there were 15, and that was uh, Mouton Rothschild had moved up in 73, but there's 14 of them. Um, quite a few of them were in Margot and San Julian. Uh, San Julian is a little bit south of Poyac, and Margot is a little bit farther south. Uh, Poyac is actually the northernmost part of the um, of of these com- communities or these communes, these towns that uh, have the classification. There's there's a few that are a little bit farther north in the Hotbrion. Um, I'm sorry, the Hotmedoc, not the Hotbrion, the Hotmedoc, um, which is a little bit the highest part of the the most northern part of the Medoc, but the Medoc is like the whole area. Um, but most of them are in Saint-Julien and Margot. Now, you've got a few in Poyac. You've got a few in saint Estif, 
uh, and they're all kind of really around each other. Pichon Longueville, um, that was one chateau and it broke up into a couple others. That's one of those that's one of those kind of more well known of the second growth. Uh, the Leoville uh, Chateau was broken up into three of them uh, the Las Casas, the Pefier, and uh, Pefere, and the uh, Leoville Barton. Uh, all in Saint Julian. Um, they were broken up into three different ones, but they're another one that I, that I know is fairly well known. Um, I'm not saying that the other ones aren't well known, especially in the people that really get into the 1855 classification, but um, they're not as uh, maybe not as well known as I as I know them. Third growths. Um, I forgot how many I thought it was another 15 of them. One, two, three, four, fifteen. Fifteen third growths throughout. Um, and these are kind of spread out through a lot of places, but a lot of them are in Margot. Um, you've got uh, one of them in the Hot Medoc, uh, La Lagune, and uh, Chateau La Lagune. And um, San Estif, he's got one. Um, I, don't, I didn't put where one of them were. Um, hopefully when I, when I put the slide up, I'll have fixed it. But um, San Julian has some of them too. But um, of these... I want to talk about Palmer is fairly well known. Lagrange is fairly well known, not the Lagrange from Australia. Um, Langoa Barton, uh, Disan, those are some of the ones that that I have seen more as far as the as far as I mean seen more often mentioned as far as the third growths. Fourth growths, you've got four, five, six, seven, eight. you have ten fourth growths in general. Again, I should have had the number on these, but I, I forgot to do that. I thought it was on there. Um, of note, Bechevel. I went there. Phenomenal chateau, and the wine was great. Uh, in Saint Julian. Again, Saint Julian is just south of Pauillac. I mean, I you could have I could have been a long walk, but I could have walked to the place. It would probably been an hour walk, but I could have walked there. That's how close they are, you know. And that's one of the things about like visiting even Bordeaux or, or just, I haven't been to Napa, but just how I've seen them on the map. And then I go out to Texas and it takes like an hour by car to get to the next chateau, not chateau, the next winery. And there's no other winery in between. Some of the ones in Fredericksburg are you could walk, you could actually walk from one to the other. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're a lot more compact up there. Uh, again, saint Julian is, and Margot are very well represented in, uh, in this. You have another hot medoc, uh, La Tour Carnet. And um, those are the only two of, I wouldn't say of note, but the only two that I really recognize the names. Fifth growths. Okay, there's a ton of them. It's like 22 of them, if I remember right. I'm sorry, 18 of them. 18 of the fifth growths. Poyak, a lot of them in Poyak, okay? Uh, Hot Madoc, another one. Um, that's where the majority of them are. You got Santa Steve uh, and uh, Margot has got some of them. But um, Poyak and Hot Madoc are really where they have that. So let's kind of talk about uh, in, in Hot uh, Batelli, that's one of, of kind of note. Lynch Bages and Lynch Musas, uh, they used to be the same, uh, they used to be the same uh, chateau. Um, Croisette Badges. Uh, actually, I think that was also associated with the Lynch Badges one. Uh, Cantemere, that was the one that was left off the list. And hence, it's the last one on the list. Um, Belgrave, those are, those are some of the ones that, if you see them, uh, uh, yeah, Batele and Hot Batele. So, uh, if you know your French better than I do, um, that right there tells you there's Batele and then there's Hot Batele, which is the one that's farther north. Like, like probably they share the property line. So literally they were split into two. Um, but let's kind of talk about the, the, the first, second, third, you know, all the growths here. Um, they're, they're divided by price. But if you look at how they're concentrated in certain areas, that kind of gives you an idea of just the area itself and the quality of the wines that they're producing. Um, and these are not the only wineries in Bordeaux. There's, um, and I didn't put in the slides, but I had meant to. There are other classifications in the Bordeaux area, but not all of them have classifications, okay? Um, oh yeah, we have to get, to, we have to, get to, the, to, the, to the white wines too. But um, 
Before I get to that, you've got um, uh, Sun and Leon has classifications, uh, and they update those fairly regularly. Um, that's really the only other one that has a lot of classifications. Um, but you've got 8,000 wineries and growers there in Bordeaux. So the 61 of just the left bank Bordeaux, and that's really what it is, just left bank, because back then they didn't really consider the right bank, even though there was a few wineries over there that produces some pretty killer wines. They didn't really think of them because the prices were, you know, weren't the same. Um, let's get into the white wines. So they have three levels for that. Now, uh, you have the superior first growth. That's Chateau de Chem. That's in Sauterne. Been there, done it, pretty amazing. If you ever have a chance to go over there, take the tour. Uh, then you have your first growths. So um, off of these... Honestly, my, my general knowledge of the Sauternes and Barsoc area of wines is pretty limited. I know Dechem. I know the other place that I went to, which is a second growth. And I may have seen some of these names here and there, but I don't really know them that well as far as the, as far as the crew, as far as the growths. And again, these aren't the only ones in Sauternes and Barsoc that produce wines. These are just the ones that they felt were the best of the best of the best of the best. And then Dechem, the best of the best of blah, 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 uh, in 1855. Um, honestly, none of them really stand out as something that I, that I really totally, totally recognize. Your second growth, so you've got quite a few of them. Now, the Doisy one, that, that split into three different uh, chateaux. You have Doisy Denae, Doisy Dubroca, and uh, Doisy Vedrine. Um, and, my, and I went to Vedrine because my friend's last name is the variation of the same name. And... Uh, it was phenomenal to go there. So if you have a chance to try the wine, great wine. Um, I'm trying to think, of, we're trying to look at the other ones that are on here. Uh, Romer, Romer du Hyatt, uh, they were also together. And uh, Lamoth and Lamoth Grand, uh, they were also together at one point. Um, honestly, any of these wines that you're going to get, you're going to be blown away. It's going to be phenomenal on that, okay? Um, and, and the whole idea, again, the classification, I said, I'm not going to go through each one of these wines and try to give you a history of all 61 of them, uh, of the Chateau. Just know that these are, if you see these names and you start looking at them, go, oh, that's a first growth, you know, Sauterne, or that's a third growth Bordeaux, all right? These wines in general are going to be pretty darn good. And they're also going to be kind of pricey. Now, all of these, I want to say all, but almost all of them have a Grand Vin, which is their primary wine that's like the best of 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 the grapes. And then you have your second wine. Um, and a lot of these second wines aren't like, you know, bad wines. I mean, they're still like $50 a bottle, okay? I mean, you know, the Grand Vin might be selling for $300 a bottle, but, you know, the second wine is selling for $50. So it's not like, oh, I can get, you know, just the one step below for $10 a bottle. But, um, you know, you... you Definitely should check them out. If you ever have a chance to go to Bordeaux, it was a phenomenal trip. I, I hope to go back there at some point in time in the future. Uh, but I have so many other places I want to visit that it's kind of hard to just go back there because I want to go visit other places. I highly suggest it. If you want to visit these wineries, the worst time in the world to go is when I went. Late August, early to late September, they're doing harvest. Actually, August in general is a bad time to visit <clears throat> any wineries in uh in Europe because everybody in Europe takes holiday in August. But uh, September is harvest time and you really want appointments when you try to go over there. Um, some of them you can probably just show up and knock on the door and get in. But I had appointments at all the ones I went to so I didn't have any free time necessarily to go knock on doors and say, hey, can I come in and videotape you or at least just taste some of your wine? Uh, but I've read a lot of people have done that and they've been very successful in getting uh, some great tours. Um, that's going to do it with the 1855 classification. Honestly, most of it was in the first like five minutes of it. Just kind of give you a history. But um, so you understand where it came from. It's not just something pulled out of a hat. But at the same time, there's a lot of people out there that say it, need to be, it needs to be updated and changed. I don't really care either way. Um, I can totally see the point that you want to keep your classifications, keep your, your rankings of things... Uh, fresh and up-to-date, truly reflective of what the wine is 
and not what it was 200 years ago or 150 years ago. Um, but at the same time, these wines have endured over time and in some ways proven that at least maybe they're not, maybe uh, this wine should be better than a fifth growth or better than a third growth. And maybe this wine should go from second to third. But as a whole, these are going to be your top wines. I hope it was a little bit enlightening for you. Uh, next week, we're going to do a sparkling wine, how it's created. And um, uh, if you find the two wines that we talked about earlier today, definitely, well, definitely the rosé. Frontier Red, not really sold on that, but, you know, it's in $7 bottle of wine, so you may want to check it out. Sorry, $11 bottle of wine, uh, so you may want to check that out. Just have something a little bit different. All right, um, as always, thank you for stopping by. Friend me up above, click the links below, and hit the donate button, and we'll see everyone again next time.